Welcome to the Managing Pests in Multifamily Housing webinar. This webinar was originally aired on April 26, 2012. The materials are brought to you by the Northeastern IPM Center at Cornell University with funding from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Your presenters today will be myself, Ali Tazy, the project coordinator at the Northeastern IPM Center that is housed at stoppests.org, and we work with housing authorities to improve pest management practices through IPM. Our other presenter will be Sandra Harrison, who's a property manager at York Housing Authority. We worked with Sandra and her program to implement IPM practices, and Sandra really took the program and ran with it, and she's going to be sharing her experiences today. Today's presentation will go over a framework for IPM to give you a basic understanding. Then Sandra will present specifically on York's experience. And then I'll give you some details on exactly how to start an IPM program at a multifamily housing property, including the resources that you'll need to access through stoppest.org. Finally, we'll make some time to answer some common questions. And if you're tuning into this webinar as a recording, if you ever have any questions, you can email us at stoppests at cornell.edu. So let's begin. You are a cockroach. A lot of people viewing this webinar will have some experiences with cockroaches, unfortunately. So think about what does it mean to be a cockroach? What's your day like? When do you like to be most active? And if this is your home, where are you finding food and water? Where do you like to hang out? Common responses are underneath the refrigerator, behind the stove, underneath the sink. And these areas do have some things in common, and we can use that to manage cockroaches. All pests need food, water, and shelter. So in that example before, behind the refrigerator, under the sink, behind the stove, these are all areas where a cockroach usually can find food, water, and shelter. And with lots of pests, they also like some warmth in their shelter. So in a location when we're inspecting, we go to where there's some warmth as well. That makes the shelter cozy. And knowing this, food, water, and shelter is crucial to good pest management. You have to know your enemy before you start to do battle. Another important part of managing pests in multifamily housing is managing the introductions. Every infestation starts with an introduction, whether it be a pest crawling in from a neighboring location or a hitchhiker that came in on, for example, a grocery bag or a piece of luggage. So if you're a cockroach, how did your ancestors arrive? And in your communities, for each pest that you run up against, think about what is going on in your community that promotes introductions. Are there a lot of holes in the outside of your buildings around pipes that's making it so rats can crawl in? Are there not door sweeps underneath the doors leading to the outside, making it so little mice can squeeze underneath? Or are your residents traveling a lot and not managing their luggage and belongings when they get home? and therefore introducing bed bugs and cockroaches and other pests. It's key to manage the introductions, and that's the preventative side of integrated pest management. So how do we know when you have an introduction and that infestation is starting? Once there's a high level infestation, once the cockroaches are waving at you on the counter at noon, it's too late then you're really going to need to use all the control methods in your toolbox. But our goal to most sustainably and efficiently manage pests is to find them before the infestation grows. And how we do that is routine inspection and monitoring. Inspection is great, knowing where to look, knowing your enemy, and then knowing where to look to find them. But for structural pest control in housing, you have to have monitors out as well. On the left hand side on the top you'll see some sticky traps and those are the monitoring devices we use for cockroaches and anything else that would be crawling around. You set them in the areas where you're likely to find pest, areas with pest conducive conditions we call it. And then below that we have the climb up interceptor for bed bugs. Placed underneath the bed frame or sofa legs it'll catch a bed bug trying to crawl onto or off from the piece of furniture. 
And for mice, your inspection, you're looking for the damage or feces that they leave behind. So the key is not only to inspect, walk into a kitchen and see if there's a cockroach waving at you from the middle of the counter, but really look with a flashlight at the areas where the pests like to hang out and then also have monitors out. Because if you find pests crawling around in an inspection during the day, chances are all the good hiding spots are already filled up. So the monitoring is key to find the infestations while they're still at a low level and relatively easy to manage. After you've found pest evidence and identified what the pest is, you want to take control. In integrated pest management, we scale the response to the level of infestation. If you're finding one spider, you might not need to do anything, or perhaps you just sweep it up. If you find a hundred spiders, the response will be different. And the same can go for even bed bugs. Just a few bed bugs is relatively easy to manage, whereas if you're finding hundreds of bed bugs on the initial inspection, it's going to take some work. And the response should never be a template. We really modify our control to the level of infestation and the location. You want to get rid of pests using more than one method. Luckily, the integrated part of integrated pest management is we have lots of control strategies available to us. If, for example, you have a resident who has multiple chemical sensitivities and cannot tolerate any pesticides being applied, that's fine. As long as we, ident we find the pest infestation before it's too heavy, chances are we can control that infestation and eliminate it and then teach the resident how to prevent it from happening ever again. So the integrated part of integrated pest management is using multiple control methods. Some examples down below, we've got a vacuum cleaner, gel bait, which is a pesticide, but it's a least risk pesticide, and doing dishes. Simple things that take food, water, and shelter away from pests or possibly kill them directly. Methods must be economical and pose the least possible risk to people, property, and the environment. Once you've tried some control methods, you have to follow up and evaluate the effectiveness of what you did. Until you follow up and inspection and monitoring finds zero pests, you need to continue to routinely visit at least monthly that home until all the pests are gone. Now, as we'll talk about, this doesn't necessarily mean calling the pest control company to come every month. It could be something that in-house staff is able to check in on, especially if you're not using pesticides in a location. So evaluating effectiveness is a key part of IPM. To summarize the steps that I just went over, you're going to inspect and monitor and teach everybody to be looking out and checking those monitors that should be in place throughout the building in all areas and in all homes. If you find some evidence or the monitors catch something, you need to identify it, figure out which enemy you're dealing with. Then, knowing your enemy, you want to determine the scale of response, know what your control options are, and respond using a combination of control methods. Example control method categories are non-chemical control, which could include traps or vacuuming, changing people's behavior, which would be teaching people to do their dishes before they go to bed so that there isn't food and water available to the pests that are active at night. Chemical control would be our pesticides, which are applied by a licensed pest management professional and chosen based on being least risk. And then biological control, an example of that might be drain enzymes, which are a biological agent that would clean out the drains that might feed filth flies. And finally, always evaluate the effectiveness of the control methods. And if it didn't work, then change something up and try again. The beauty of integrated pest management is that we have lots of control options. It's just finding the right combination for each site. The priority pests that we deal with mostly in multifamily housing across the country are cockroaches, rodents, and bedbugs. And if you visit stoppests.org and look at our training materials, you'll see that most of the time we're covering cockroaches, rodents, or bedbugs. This is for two main reasons. One, all three of these pests have a lot of public health significance. Cockroaches cause asthma in infants and trigger asthma attacks in those that are sensitive and they can contaminate food. 
Rodents such as mice and rats carry disease, bite, destroy property, and may cause fires, and they may trigger asthma attacks. Bed bugs are a nuisance and are expensive, and just the stress alone from dealing with them can have health significance. The other reason is that the control methods that we use for these pests also work on a lot of others. So for example, if you have rats on your property and you've identified where they are, where they're eating and where they're drinking and you clean up and you get a dumpster that doesn't have holes in it and you make sure that the trash is getting emptied during the daytime, then you're taking away the food and water for rats but you're also taking food and water away from, for example, feral cats, or dogs, or skunks, or raccoons, which are all pests that some properties deal with. You just heard me mention public health, and a lot of what we do in integrated pest management is focused on health, because ultimately our goal is to provide this safe and decent housing for our residents. We want to make homes healthy, and IPM is part of this nationwide Healthy Homes movement to reduce housing-based health hazards. A healthy home, as defined by HUD, is dry, clean, ventilated, safe, contaminant-free, maintained, and pest-free. And hopefully at this point in the presentation you're thinking, well, we've already talked about drying things up and cleaning things up and, and maintaining things, so, so how does IPM play in? Is IPM just pest-free? And in fact, it's not. An IPM program is kind of an umbrella program that will get at all aspects of a healthy home. So if you're thinking of starting up an IPM program in your area, look at some of the local organizations and possibly your health department and check out the projects they're involved in. If they're working in healthy housing, they may want to partner with you as a housing provider on your IPM program. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when I get into the resources that you can leverage in your area. But just know that everyone can come together on this whole concept of healthy housing because nobody wants to live with pests. IPM is different from a conventional pest management program in a few ways. Um, there are no routine pesticide applications. So if you're simply having a pest control company come in and apply bait in kitchens quarterly, that's not IPM. Gel bait is a least risk pesticide, but it's that's a routine pesticide application. And if you remember, you need to identify the pest before ever taking control. So if there are no pests present, there's nothing to identify. You're not taking control actions with pesticides yet. IPM is more proactive versus reactive, so you're out there inspecting and monitoring, finding pest infestations when they're at, at either introduced or at a very low level, not reactive. A reactive would be just waiting for a resident to call, and we've found time and time again that if you wait for residents to report, chances are the infestation will be bad, the resident will have tried their own concoctions, and things get out of hand before they call for help, in some cases. So it's better to be proactive and more sustainable in the long run. In an IPM program, every unit and building area is inspected and monitored. You don't leave anything out, and especially the monitoring part. Don't just use monitors when there's a pest problem. Don't just use monitors to figure out if you've got it under control. Have monitors out so that residents can be checking for themselves, and it's a way to get everybody on the same page. It's evidence-based. So if a resident is reporting pests, maintenance staff can go do an initial check or the pest control company can come. And if the monitoring and inspection isn't showing any pests, then you might be looking at different issues than simply pest control. So you want to be monitoring at all times. IPM is also a team approach. And this is really what sets IPM apart and what makes it possibly a little more work but more sustainable and rewarding in the long run and effective. Um, you educate site staff, residents, pest management professionals, and other stakeholders on IPM, how to think like the pest, and then everybody's out there in this battle watching for pests and also working together against the pest pressures. And I'll talk a little bit more um, after San Sandra's going to talk quite a bit about the team approach that she started up in York. And then following that, I'll talk about some of the resources that are available to educate everyone on your IPM team. 
The nice thing about having this team approach is that you can divide responsibilities among team members. So for example, if you know that mice are getting in, perhaps door sweeps need to be installed underneath doors leading to the outside, and that might fall on the shoulders of the maintenance staff. Perhaps there's a resident who does not know how to clean and that's why their housekeeping is not up to snuff. Well in that case perhaps the property manager or housing inspector would run a class. You're not putting all of your eggs in one basket in terms of pest control. Everybody has a part. I mentioned that the IPM team is key and that you're going to divide responsibilities up but at the end of the day the pest management professional is critical to an effective pest management program. Not only because they are the ones who are going to apply pesticides, but also because you can think of them as a consultant. The pest management professional under an IPM scope of work will focus on the source of the problem, make recommendations to site staff and residents, spend appropriate time on infestation, so spending more time where there are pests and less time where there are not, and you can think of them as a consultant. Some pest management professionals are happy to run, for example, um, classes for your residents in the evenings during resident council meetings. That's just one example. But think of these pest management professionals as consultants and really part of your team. An IPM service definitely includes exclusion, vacuuming, trapping. It's not just someone who walks around spraying baseboards. That really is not the way pest control is done anymore. And as I've mentioned, these pest management professionals know to use the least risk products and application methods. And in order to maintain their licensing, pest management professionals need to stay up to date and stay current on the best technology out there. One of the common questions that I get is, how can you contract out for pest control services? Because a lot of housing authorities are tied into the low bid process. And if you go to stoppest.org, we have a sample RFP there that is based on qualifications, not on price. It'll get you out of that low bid process. But know that you might have to pay a little bit more because you're actually going to get pest control. Right now, you may just be paying for routine spraying. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sandra Harrison from the York Housing Authority. Sandra and her team received the StopPest.org IPM and Multifamily Housing Training, and it served as a kickoff event. At the training day was the site staff, some residents, their pest management professional, some representatives from local offices that might be interested in healthy housing or supporting York Housing in their efforts with IPM. And after that training day, Sandra really took it and ran with it. And she focused in on the people side. And that's what I want her to tell us about today. So Sandra, thank you so much for joining us. Hello, my name is Sandra Harrison of York Housing Authority in Pennsylvania. And I'm going to speak about IPM implementation at our housing authority. Our goal in implementing an IPM program at our housing authority was to increase awareness and to use IPM as a tool for change. I will discuss how we accomplished that. I will speak about the involvement of people. I will talk about setting the stage for this change, how we communicated the mission throughout the community and throughout our property, Effective case management, what commitment is required, and then the exciting part is how we incorporated the IPM policies and principles into our policies. Setting the stage. It's very important to dismantle preconceived notions about residents in public housing. The people that need to be involved are site staff, contractors, residents, children, both adult and minor, relatives living in the household, property managers, executive directors, maintenance supervisors, and support services, outside agencies. And we were creative and assertive and sometimes a little aggravating. For example, we pushed what we believed in. After the training that we received from our support IPM center, 
we signed a commitment with each and every resident. Ways to overcome the preconceived notions. We involved maintenance. We involved them from the beginning. It allowed them to witness the change firsthand. We required them to attend the first initial visit and the same staff had to perform the work throughout the case until the work was completed. We let the maintenance person witness the programming as it unfolded. The second way that we dismantled preconceived notions was we interacted with the community. We fostered informative opportunities with the residents. As Ollie mentioned earlier, we went to local colleges, we solicited for any information that they had available. We went to health centers and many other city organizations. And then thirdly, we communicated, not just talking, we communicated with the resident. We had meetings, we established goals, and we discussed what obstacles that there would be. We did this consistently. We, it was very exciting because we communicated the mission to everybody. We established IPM as a positive method and tool for assisting in overcoming challenges to pest elimination. We had brochures, we had flyers, we made things for the kids. Um, so it was very positive. We also had a certificate at the completion of their programming that each resident would receive and we used good paper and we laminated it. And then we also allowed our residents and encouraged them to put that on their resumes. And it was also helpful then in um, getting maybe an interview or with their programming that they would have. The last thing that we did was we established IPM as a tool for residents to solve housekeeping violations. For example, if there was a lease violation for housekeeping and lack of cooperation and they were designated as one of our units that we were enrolling in the programming, we would allow them the opportunity to neutralize the violation. For example, if you have a lease violation and if you are a participant of IPM at the graduation or completion of your programming, the violation would be neutralized. Another example in setting the stage is by communicating IPM as a tool. When a resident has cultural practices that are suspect to be contributory to the problem or their practices are not conducive to maintaining a pest-free home, then IPM is staged as a way to learn, to teach new methods of maintaining their home. We fostered buy-in by tying together a need and an opportunity. That is, they need to overcome specific challenges to achieve pest elimination and we gave them the information so that they could share it with their families. We presented IPM as a privilege and a positive program to be a part of. We used very creative ways, marketing media, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, stickers and magnets. We also engaged our community social service program that we had at our site. Our social services department had a health fair and we made it mandatory as a part of their recertification that they attend the health fair. At the health fair, we were able to allow them to view the video. It allowed us the opportunity to engage with the residents and it was in a non-threatening, a fun environment. Another community involvement that we did was we, if we partnered with our nursing uh, facility through our local college. They were very instrumental in distributing flyers. They also were very helpful. It's very important to communicate these expectations throughout the agency and the community that we expect that they do not have to live with pests. We also showed vacant units to our current residents because Many times we had to undo their complacency or undo what they had become accustomed to over years and years of living there. We created before and after photo albums, gave them an opportunity, and also it gave them 
the ability to believe that they could accomplish this too because there were their neighbors. There were no identifying factors with the photo album. And we established a three-part to-do list in our programming. And what that consisted of was the resident had very specific duties. Our maintenance department had very specific duties. And then the manager had very specific duties. All of this fostering a sense of buy-in and definitely a sense of engagement on the resident's part. And for the majority of the community, they were able to participate in the health fair. If you moved in, you were participating, but it was very important for us to capture the rest of the community. So we scheduled evening meetings with our PMP, our professional, in again, a informal, relaxed atmosphere which gave the residents an opportunity to ask questions and even gave them the opportunity if they had specific issues that they wanted to discuss with the professional. In effective case management, those units that were identified, it was very important to personalize the programming. For example, we had a working mother. She had no assistance from her adult children. So we were creative and we gave the adult children a lease violation with their name on it. That really motivated the adult children because they did not want their mother to lose their home. It stopped them from, while she was at work all day long, sitting around playing the Xbox and the Nintendo and eating chips and dropping candy and not cleaning the dishes in the sink. Because the mother was violated and because they were violated, it fostered a sense of responsibility on their part. The mother reported to us that her kids assisted and they stopped those behaviors. Another example in making your case management specific is many times there's young mothers in our community and there may be first time apartment dwellers that just don't know how to clean. So we actually would go in in our case management and show them how to clean. We'd lift up the stove. We would actually show them how to get the corner, how to clean between new radiators, how to make it a requirement and a fun time to have your family all sit at the dinner table and eat. And then just some simple things like sweep up the floor. What we found is that many times when the, uh, their first time home dwellers or young mothers without the support systems before they came to us, they just didn't know how to clean. So that was fun and engaging. And later on, I'll have some before and after pictures, which really was great for our staff to see because that, again, dismantled their preconceived notions that we're just stuck in this situation. Here goes our before and after pictures. You can see the crumbs on the floor, but look at the after. You have to feel good about that. Again, the kids just eating and that's Kool-Aid. But now look at the room in the after. Again, just something simple, not leaving dishes in the sink. Cleaning under the stove top. Required commitment. We had an agreement with the regional IPM center, which was a little frightening, if I'm being honest at first, because the agreement does expect that you have buy-in and that you have commitment. And my first thought when I saw the agreement was, oh, Lord, how am I going to have time to do this? How am I going to be able to do this? But actually, once you became involved and the rewards were great and it didn't take that much time. It just required that you would be committed to making sure that your residents were able to take advantage of the opportunity. Our pest management professional, we scheduled meetings with him. We had a system, as Ollie spoke about earlier, where we could monitor what he was doing, making sure that all of his appointments were kept and that there was follow through. And our property staff, it was amazing because once they started to see residents changing behaviors that they had um, usually consistently engaged in, they became excited about IPM also. They were so involved. 
And of course, there is an element of time that you have to commit, but for the result, it was well worth it. Incorporating RPM into policies. As a property manager, this was very exciting for me. Um, during all IPM appointments, we required that the head of household be present. We made sure that they knew exactly what the programming was and that we could get their commitment. We had them sign an agreement also. We implemented a new policy and procedure that all new residents had to view our IPM video at move-in. And during that time, it gave us an opportunity to field any questions that they had and to answer any um, concerns. And maybe um, they came with some issues. Um, one example was we had a new move-in that had an infestation problem before they came. So when they saw the IPM video, they immediately asked, well, what can we do? Because we certainly don't want to bring that situation in our new home. And we were able to solve it before they actually moved in. It's very important to use lease language when you're implementing an IPM program. And the ways to do that, of course, there's boards and there's resident councils. But again, to communicate, not just talk to people, but to communicate the goals and the programming, it will be a segue and a, a step towards getting your boards to approve what you need in your leases. And we can provide um, some example lease language if there's an interest. Require residents to attend at least one professional, one PMP meeting on an annual basis. The way that we've accomplished this is during their annual recertification interview, we let them know and we have three dates already prearranged with our professional and they have the ability to choose which one that they will come to. And we impose a violation also for not reporting pests. And it's very important when you have a new employee, train them, let them know how to look for problems, train them on what to say to residents, make them aware. Thank you so much, Sandra, for sharing your story. So we've talked about what IPM is, the basics on how to approach pest control through IPM. And Sandra shared her stories on how they focused on residents and getting the team members engaged. And now I want to step back and talk about how to start an IPM program housing authority wide. This is kind of the, the template that we've learned to follow from working with so many housing authorities. So first and foremost, you want to have a qualified pest management firm or license your staff. As I mentioned, IPM is a team approach, but a qualified PMP is crucial. And you can use the resources I'll talk about a little bit later to get out of the low bid process and contract a good pest management firm. Then you want to pick a pilot site. A good size pilot site is about 100 units with an enthusiastic and willing property manager. And that part's key because IPM at the end of the day is all about getting the people involved and getting everybody to do their part. And the property manager holds the reins at a site. An active tenant council can be very useful. If you've got an enthusiastic property manager, that probably means more than an active tenant council, but some way to engage residents is useful and the tenant council is often that avenue. Once you've picked your pilot site, you want to incorporate pest specific codes into the work order system for that site and train IPM team members using resources from stoppest.org. The pest specific codes in the work order system help you better track and monitor the property and training everybody is how we get everyone to know the enemy and do their part. So you've got your pilot site in place and then you identify focus areas. Figure out where you're going to focus your efforts to show everyone that IPM is the way things are getting done and to have impact on the pest populations that might exist. How we do that is to monitor and inspect and look through service records and work orders for trends. If you already have monitoring going on, that's great. You want to make sure that you're getting into every home at least once a year and that you're keeping records on what the trap catches are. You want to have monitoring traps out and tracking all these trends in the service records. 
If you're just starting out, kick off your program with a property-wide monitoring inspection. Get into every area, every unit, take this opportunity to educate people and hand out flyers on what IPM is, but most importantly, get into every area and record whether there's a problem there. Once you know where the problems exist and where they don't, you can focus your efforts. If you don't have any pests anywhere, that's great. Your focus areas are going to be pest conducive conditions. So maybe door sweeps need to be replaced or there are a lot of pipe penetrations in the side of walls that need to be sealed up. That could be a focus topic. Um, but usually we can find some sort of pest problem if we do a property wide inspection. Then you allocate time and resources to solving those problems. Focus on an area until the pests are gone. No problems. Focus on monitoring and prevention. Then you want to maintain and expand pest-free housing. In that pilot site, you probably will run up against the need to tweak lease language, to maybe initiate some policy, to change resident housekeeping standards, or start up a class. You want to test all of these things out at the pilot site before rolling it out portfolio-wide. Some practices that other housing authorities have reported that starting it up or starting it up again has been useful and contributed to their IPM program is inspecting new residents' homes within 90 days of move-in. Most properties do get in and inspect the home at move-in, but people haven't unpacked, they haven't started living and establishing their routines in that home. So it's really helpful to do a 90 day or 60 day inspection after people have set up shop and established their routines. By doing that automatically, you may catch poor housekeeping habits or possibly hoarding, things like that, before they get out of hand and contribute to pest problems. And all of that is on the prevention side of integrated pest management. You want to ensure that the PMP gets access to units, and that may mean some sort of community-wide promotional program, Market IPM, as Sandra talked about. And you want to teach everyone to prevent, inspect, and monitor so introductions never turn into infestations. I'm an optimist, but I'm not so much of an optimist to think that we'll never have pests in public housing again, that we could get a IPM in there and never have pests. That's not realistic. But what I do feel strongly is that we can get our pest control to a point in public housing that we're managing infestations at the low level and getting rid of them. Identifying infestations and not letting them grow and spread. I don't think anyone in America should have to live with a high level infestation in their home. We know how to kill these bugs. It's not rocket science. So if we all come together on this and implement integrated pest management, we can manage these pests in a sustainable way. So once you've figured out how to do it at one site, you want to expand that program to other sites. Use the policies and procedures that worked at the pilot site at other properties and eventually get portfolio wide. And ideally, a housing authority or housing provider would become a, a leader in the community. I know a lot of housing authorities that are their local expert for bed bugs, and they're doing a fantastic job of figuring out what the control methods are and how to manage this pest in a sustainable way that's not going to completely blow their budget. So be a leader in your community for pest control. The program costs, the reality again. An IPM budget will include materials for caulking and sealing holes, free items for residents in need such as cleaning supplies, mattress encasements, and monitors like Sandra mentioned, and an IPM contract which, as I mentioned, might cost more but you're actually paying for pest management as opposed to just some sort of routine pesticide application. Um, the materials as far as caulking and sealing holes, everything that's around excluding pests from your property, that might already be in the maintenance budget. That might not be extra, but you're just, when doing these repairs, really focusing on making the repair so that a pest couldn't get through it. Expected program outcomes, and this is why I come to work in the morning is hearing about the increased cooperation and communication that results from an effective IPM program. Residents and staff and the pest control contractor are all working together against the bugs. Decreased pesticide applications, one of our housing authorities who have an in-house pest control crew, they decrease pesticide applications by 50% in a year. 
It's pretty impressive. They stopped doing the routine spraying and they only applied pesticides when their routine inspection and monitoring found evidence of pests and they were able to cut back on that. And that was a cost to them because again it was, it was in-house so they were paying for those pesticides. Increased partnership with outside agencies. Uh, we've got two housing authorities that we've worked with that through their IPM program partnered with their local health department. The health department had some funding and people available to work on IPM related things and these housing authorities received funding from their local health department, leveraged those funds to educate their residents on IPM and really get their program going. So if you're thinking that the cost might be too much, get creative, partner with outside agencies because again all of us can come together on this topic of healthy housing through integrated pest management. And the ultimate goal is infestations being limited to periodic introductions. No high-level infestations. Throughout this presentation, I've mentioned resources that are available at stoppest.org. I want to give you a quick tour of the website, but I encourage you all to go to stoppest.org and explore for yourself. From the home page, which is pictured here, you've got the Pest Solutions button, which come to a screen that has pictures of a bunch of different pests. If you click on your pest of interest, you'll find how to think like that enemy, food, water, and shelter, and below that links to the resources we recommend for the multifamily housing audience. For example, bed bugs under that, we've got not only HUD's notices there, but fact sheets and flyers you could distribute to staff and residents, and also lots of videos that have been produced on bed bugs. The search function of the website is quite robust, so if you're looking for lease language, you could type in lease language there, and you'll get a list of areas in the website that link to lease language. I mentioned getting a good contract for pest control. You could type in RFP or contract, and you'll get to those pages as well. Of course, everything is nested on the content of the pages which are linked to at the bottom under About Us, What is IPM, Working with Residents, IPM Training, and Success Stories. So you can get to it through exploring there, but I like to use the search function because I usually know exactly what I want to get out of the website. The other items that are by that building on the main page are our often updated topics. We've got blog entries, which I'll talk about in a second, training opportunities, and funding opportunities. Training opportunities might be on-site training, might be a conference, might be a webinar. Just anything that comes across our desk that we think is pertinent for the multifamily audience we'll share on that training opportunities page. In addition, that funding opportunities page, if a funding opportunity comes our way and we think that it's something that a housing authority could apply for or partner with someone to apply for, we post it there. Sometimes you have to be a little creative for finding grant funding for integrated pest management, but again, anything that mentions healthy housing could be IPM. The blog that I mentioned is the IPM and Multifamily Housing blog at stoppests.typepad.com. There you can subscribe where that left hand arrow is, enter your email address and you'll get the almost weekly posts. The content is current and relevant, so I will post about some pest that is seasonal. So this time of year there's a lot of things that are getting active, termites and ants, things like that. Um, I've got a post plan about ticks is one example. Another popular feature on the blog is the newsletter article and the right hand arrow is pointing to all of our past newsletter articles. Once a month I pick a topic that's really pertinent for residents and a property may want to put in their resident newsletter and I give you a sample newsletter article that you can copy and paste and fill in BHA or housing provider specific information. Use it however you may. Uh, we provide that information. The one this month was on housekeeping, which is usually one of the main focuses of any IPM program in multifamily housing. Other parts of the website that you may be interested in, I mentioned that Sandra's team got trained by our trainers at Stop Pests in the Northeastern IPM Center, and all the training materials are available online. Under the IPM Training tab, you'll see all of the green words are links to presentations or documents, and you're welcome to download these and use them. 
we appreciate you letting us know how you're using them and that allows us to track that but we've gotten emails from health departments housing providers pest control companies lots of people are using these materials they're very well vetted they're supported by epa usda hud the national pest management association and others and they do get updated annually when taken all together it makes up our full day ipm training that i that saunders group went through but you can also look through individual presentations and use them. One thing to note is that each slide does have instructor notes associated with it, so if you want to learn the full story, you would look at each slide and read the instructor notes. Those notes are kind of the transcript that goes along with each slide, what the instructor is supposed to cover. Another training resource that's free is the tenant's role in IPM video. We recommend that properties use this welcoming residents in or at annual resign. Have the resident watch the video and in return for watching the video, give them some sort of incentive. Sa Sandra mentioned the IPM kits that we've distributed and on this residence briefing video page is a list of what goes into those kits. All things that they can use to help do their part in IPM like food containers, a Tupperware or a sponge. The videos are available in English and Spanish with, with subtitles and you can either watch them from the website or download them and burn them to CDs. We want you to use them however you see fit. Finally, if you want to work directly with us as one of the PHAs that receives an on-site training, the way to do that is to go into the training opportunities page and fill out our training request form. We're not entirely sure what our funding is going to look like next year, so we can't promise anything. But if you fill out this form, I'll do my best to fill your request, whether it be training with some of our trainers, or there are lots of different training organizations that we work closely with, and maybe one of them is training in your area. So you never know until you ask if you are interested in getting training for your site or staff or just attending a training that's for others. Fill out the form and I'll let you know what's happening in your area. Other IPM resources that almost everyone starting IPM or looking to improve IPM find useful are HUD's notices. PIH 2011-22 is their notice on integrated pest management and it really goes into the details of what an IPM program should involve. And then HUD has two notices, the PIH notice and the housing notice on bed bug control. Some websites that are useful, of course, stoppest.org. The National Center for Healthy Housing has a lot of information as well, and the, you'll notice that they have an IPM training and the presentation slides are identical. We work very closely with the National Center for Healthy Housing and um, share a lot of resources. The National Pesticide Information Center is the place to go if you have pesticide questions and they also have a lot of great resources that are user-friendly and can be printed out and handed out um, fact sheets, things like that. Boston's Healthy Pest-Free Housing Initiative is another great resource. We do link to it from Stop Pests under the Success Stories page, or you can go directly to it with this link. Boston Housing Authority partnered with their health department and universities and lots of different groups and really did a fantastic job with their IPM program. We've learned a lot from them and love that they've shared their resources with us through this page. HUD's Office of Healthy Homes and Lead Hazard Control also has a website and they link to a lot of good resources as well. It's always nice to just be able to talk directly with someone. And for that, I'd encourage you to look up your local cooperative extension office and that website there, you can click on the map and, and drill down to where you are. Cooperative extension promotes university-based information and they may have a structural IPM expert on board who's excited to partner with a new group. And stoppests at cornell.edu will come to our program. I'll receive the email and if I can't fill your request or put you in touch with someone local, I'll find someone who can. So feel free to email me even the smallest question and I'll try and help you out. Thank you so much for viewing this presentation. I hope you found it helpful. Please feel free to provide feedback or ask questions by emailing us at stoppests at cornell.edu. We appreciate the work you do to provide pest-free, healthy housing, and good luck with your IPM efforts.